Happy Monday, everybody. Yo! I mean, if that isn't a Beat Saber song, it should be. <laughs> like, just listening to it, like, I'm just, mm. like, thinking, like, like oh, shoot, down, shoot. Left, right. Yeah. yeah. This is uh, Mercy, the new Monster Cat song from Boss Fight and F-O-O-L. Monster Cat, I think, has a couple of music packs for Beat Saber, I believe. Yep, yep. Yeah. So, uh, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, you saw that on there somewhere. Hello, everybody. We're going to do weird things here in a minute. It's January 18, 2021. <sighs> yeah, man. Hello. Settling into the new year, breaking it in like 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 new shoes, putting our foot in it, you know, walking yeah. around, doing that little These hop laces thing. Laces too tight. Am I am I gonna undo the top lace? I don't know. Mm -hmm. We're figuring it out. You're in the store and you're kind of you're kind of like half jogging, but you're really not going at full speed because people are around and you really don't want to you don't want to seem to that into it. But you need to see yeah. if they how they fit. You know, yeah, you want to like, you know, like kind of start, like get into a stance oh. real quick, you know. Oh. 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 But then someone's looking and you're just like, uh, like you're pretending to stretch. Oh, yes. Oh. You take it off and you bend it and you wonder if that tells you anything about the shoe at all. Exactly. It does like not. Like Jerry Seinfeld and Bill Gates in that ad from a million years ago. Oh my God. It does feel like a million years ago. That was, that yeah. was maybe... I guess what 12 years 12 years yeah i think so yeah late late uh <coughs> balmer microsoft right we were like a couple years away from him turning over the reins uh something like that oh to patel not to balmer no 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 to... balmer had it by that that point like uh, uh yeah bill, balmer. bill yeah, gates yeah. was a yeah late head. late 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 balmer late oh. balmer yeah while while balmer uh, was ceo to uh, Satya Nadella, right? Oh, no, it's, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. For some reason, I thought his last name was Patel. I was wrong. No, that's... Uh, Satya Mania. Satya Mania running wild. I think that's Google. I think that's one of the Google Oh, uh, yeah. That sounds right. Yeah. That's where Microsoft realized, you know where we should be in? We should put more in, into this cloud thing as opposed to trying to build phones to compete with Apple. <laughs> or or you might be thinking of uh, Verge uh, journalist Nilay Patel. Could be. Could be. He's, he's always we, could, we, could, we can spend an hour exploring my latent racism. No. Okay. Well, we didn't, didn't <laughs> in, need to in, go that into, way. Into, into the mind palace of where Brian pulled the name. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hello. Happy Monday, everybody. We're going to get started here in just a minute. How are you doing, Andrew? Yeah. I'm at that point in my life where I get asked to write letters of recommendation for people. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> you're gonna need a you're gonna need a template. You're gonna start need to make a form letter. I, I have that now. I do have that now. It's just <laughs> it's just a I've had this happen a couple times now and I'm like, me? <laughs> like, like I'm all right, you're an excuse to get out of something. Curly bracket name and curly bracket is one of the best curly bracket occupations and curly bracket oh, yeah. that I've ever curly bracket relationship. I tell you, I, I have, because I've had to do a lot more booking myself for PX3. Uh, I just made a little form thing. So now like the, the, the goal was for me from at the point that I read something that I like on the internet to email the author as fast as possible to ask them on the show. Because I know the more I think about like, oh, I'll get to it. My, my, my. So I just made myself a little form email. That's just, and, and at first I felt it was like, ah, oh, it's kind of grody because I wanted this to be organic, but it's like, nope, you want to know what? I agree with every line of this email. I just read your blank. Uh, uh, and then what I really liked about it was the thing I really liked, like fill in a space <laughs> thing I really liked about it. I'd like for you to come on the show. We record on these days. It takes a half hour. Uh, uh, please let me know if you'd be able to do it. Like, and that's and that's that. It's like, uh, uh, man, uh, there is an element of our life that can very much be done by, you know, a a, a bot or or AI. I, you know, I, you'd like to sign you off. You don't on it, but... say. Mm. Yeah. Hey, uh, Justin, do you have any? Um... Any open mics or something on your channel? We're getting some noise from. No, you, you want to know what? I don't know what the problem is, but my 
my uh, mic or my, my board is giving me crazy feedback. And I had that on the PX3 Extra today. I was okay. wondering whether or not it was going to come on, come through over Opal, but it looks like it does. So hold on. I'll just have to totally bypass it and use a, a what's it called? A, okay. a, a thing. A thing. Sure, go for it. Um, not crazy, but you can hear it. Not crazy. No, I heard. I, I thought it was coming from you. No, it's uh, passing it through from Justin. Glad we could figure that out. I uh, I want to. I I kind of think I want to talk about my new project on After Things. Right on. Um, I've been. On are we voting on this? I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> we we don't have to, but uh. It's uh I don't know. I'm ex I'm excited for it. I feel inspired in a way I haven't been in a in a long time working on it. So uh yeah. That's just some cool stuff going on with me. Good afternoon from America, enlightened underscore pockets. Ah, hello. Yeah, over there in Australia. Um it must be what, the early evening there, I believe, right? Uh, well, he said good morning, so I'm going to take him for his word oh. and say it's probably morning. Oh, yeah. You know, I thought, well, see, this is this is my morning, 1 p.m. And so I thought, well, oh, maybe he's just <laughs> can't be morning over there. It it's us. my morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, whew, man, what's going on? What's going on? Um, 646 a.m. Good God, man. What are you doing? Woo. Go back to bed. No, stay in bed. Keep your phone on, but go back to bed. <laughs> yeah. Actually, leave your phone playing, but go but go to sleep. That's right. <laughs> Dan, you know what? what? Turn every phone on in the house and device to listen to this. There you go. Yeah, that's it. Then go to bed. <laughs> and call the neighbors. Do you, do you guys listen to any like talk shows or anything while you go to bed? I've, I've been listen I'll put on a podcast with a sleep timer. Yeah, I will as well, and I'll I'll try to make sure that that the sleep timer is um, less than the remaining running time. But it's hard because I play it faster than one x speed, so it's oh. like you kind of have to guess. Like, okay, forty five minutes left in the podcast, uh, the tw and there's no twenty five minute. It's like fifteen minutes and then thirty minutes on the sleep timer. Oh, interesting. So so it's like I don't know. Do we? Because then then you wake up and and then you know it's no longer even in your feed. Much, you know, right. so you can't go back and figure and out like I definitely what point don't remember what out. you even had it set to. Yeah. Yeah. Did you find a new I, Oh, go to Andrew. Well, I could never even imagine listening to anything that was nonfiction before I go to sleep. It really? always has to be fiction for me. Hmm. Really? Because I like to think about stuff. And in nonfiction's hard. I mean, fiction's easy because it'd be like, you know, wow, so the meteor hurtled towards the planet. They had to figure out what to do. <laughs> Okay, great. You know, I'm like, here's the thing you have to think about the implications of killer robots and, you know, kindergartens. I'm like, yeah, let me think about this. And then mm, yeah. Six hours later, I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's most, this is, that is most of where I've been getting my podcast listening time has been in bed, which is not good because I also like have been ending up not going back and re listening to whatever those shows are. And I'm not driving very much. So, and I already didn't drive very much anyway, but, um, but yeah, weird, weird, weird stuff. I woke, I, I had, uh, maybe a week or two ago where I woke up and in the morning and some podcast was playing and I realized, oh no, I just burned through eight hours of, oh no, who knows how many shows. <laughs> That's what killed me with Game of Thrones is I would wake up at like 5 a.m. and I'd hear on Sunsaw. Uh, <laughs> no. and I'd be like, oh, geez, I just missed like eight hours and I don't know what happened. Hey, Justin, you back? Yeah. How's my audio? Mm. Better? Pristine. Pristine. <clears throat> crystal clear. Crystalline clear. Then I guess that's something that I'll have to do today is rip off, <laughs> rip open my board. And See, I still hear static, but I guess... It's all right. Um, as long as it sounds good to you, Bryce. I'm hearing, I'm hearing a little bit, in, a little bit of room tone, but nothing we can't. Well, it's better than it was a minute. No, if it's, if it's good for you, it's fine. Okay. I'll just suffer. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay. Um. Well. Uh. Let's start the show. How about that? Um, yeah. Cool. I will count you in, Andrew. In three, two. 
Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. Hello, friends. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. 67 seconds, gentlemen. The SLS rocket. The uh the the what's supposed to be the, the Vanguard premier heavy launch vehicle to push America further into space did a test over the weekend and they were able to get engine burn for 67 seconds. Unfortunately, they were trying for eight minutes. Yeah. Oh, oh it's Ouch. so tough because like I want I want I want a lot of people to succeed. I want everyone to succeed. It like what? It got too hot? Is that what it was? We don't know yet. We yeah. don't know. There's like a shutdown and it's like shut down. Oh, but there was a pretty rainbow over the water tower. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> and, and this just says major component failure. Uh, yeah. They have and, four engines. These are the same engines that were on the space shuttle. In the case of one of them, literally the same engine that was on a space shuttle. Oh, really? Like the year actual old physical? Yeah. Wow. Yes. Uh, so as we've talked about, the SLS rocket, uh, has been going on for a very long time. And, uh, according to the original plan, you know, this thing would have been up and around the moon by now. This was a pretty major test. It's not, if people are like, oh, you learn by testing. Yeah. The goal was to test it and then ship it to Canaveral the end of this end of, you know, by February. Um, oh not, wow! This so is, this was a yeah, this, this was, was a, a this um, was a dress rehearsal. This is a yeah, it's a air quotes test. Who knows air quotes what will happen? Uh, wink, wink. Look, we got this in the bag, buddy. Don't worry about it. So much so that because the idea is this is to hot fire the engine. The eight minutes is the amount of thrust that they would be using to basically send uh, Orion around the moon, right? So let's run the thing for eight minutes, make sure the engines can run for eight minutes. They bolt it to a test stand. And it's a pretty impressive thing to see how big this thing is and what's going on. Then at one point, NASA had been even if in the goal to try to get the moon quickly, it had been proposed, like, what if we just skipped this hot fire test entirely? And went straight to launch, and then NASA's like, "No, we want to do a, we want to do this this hot fire test to make sure." And and let's we'll iterate for a moment the difference between like the SpaceX approach and the NASA approach. SpaceX approach is like, "Yeah, we'll think it, we think it'll work. Let's put it on a stand and run it. Oh, it blew up. Ah, design flaw. Let's go back and fix this because we found that piece, and we built we have five more built to go." The NASA approach is, "Let's test every component right, and then." The first launch, you know, the first time we really try to do this thing will be the for reals. We talked about before, the space shuttle never launched without people. It wasn't capable of doing that. The first time the space shuttle launched in that configuration with the solid rocket boosters, that engine configuration, it had people on board. That was, yeah. there were no tests before then. Uh, this is a similar configuration. It has four engines instead of like the shuttles three, but it has solid rocket boosters. And it just has its payload up on top. There's no orbiter. And the theory was, oh, you know, well, we're using all these tested components and stuff because this will be a cheaper, faster way to build a rocket because we'll just use stuff we've used before. But in a slightly different configuration we've never used before and components are now 25 years old. Yeah, it's tough because on the one hand, I definitely applaud the cautious uh, extra step of, you know, doing the testing and, and whatever. But, but also, uh, I don't know, like, I, I feel so... I would imagine, this is pure speculation, I would imagine it's very, very tough to be at NASA where you are squeezed. Uh, like during the space race, you had unlimited budget, unlimited fails, everybody was throwing money at you left and right. But now you're squeezed behind, uh, between the science and a bunch of... Um, uh, 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 pencil neck geeks, a bunch of pencil pushers telling you, you got to spend this amount and you got to show results. And well, why are we making a new engine when we have these old engines laying around and all that stuff? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but, uh, but I, I just, I, I really feel for NASA, uh, especially since, uh, I, I don't know. It just feels like they're squeezed and in the middle of, of, of two well, immo immovable or well, unstoppable we, we, forces. And just to add the fact that, this is often, you get your funding from senators who say, well, you've got to use basically, hint, hint, if you don't use the company in my home state, exactly. you ain't getting funded, 
Right. And and the part of the reason we have SLS was the only way we were able to get the crew, you know, the the private crew stuff was partial agreement was like, yeah, we'll fund, we'll let you hire SpaceX and other companies to launch rockets, but SLS gets funded. Hmm. Yeah, and and I think that we should probably point out that what we have thought of NASA in the rise of SpaceX is different than than what we're seeing here. In in when we say NASA, this is the NASA approach. This is when NASA builds stuff in house, right? And 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 the paradigm shift that SpaceX and Blue Origin can provide is a off the rack approach uh, that they are vetting and creating their own products that NASA can then say, okay, well we'll do X, Y, or Z. We will allocate our money that way, but. You know, the SLS is something that I think is fascinating because we can see in a parallel timeline, all right, SLS got approved during the Obama administration. In that intervening time, where are we now with either project? <laughs> like, where are we now in terms of what SpaceX has done as an off-the-rack approach? Where are we in terms of of uh, the federal government trying to build their own rockets in the way that we initially did, you know, back in the the 60s and 70s well, and and I think we're seeing what the results are. We're also seeing I, there is a you have James Webb Space Telescope that has been like like 15 years, 10 years overdue. That consistently this big project has consistently failed. You have the Orion capsule, which I think we talked about before, they found out like, yeah, we think some of the systems may not be working right, but it's too late to fix it, so we're just going to reroute around it which is problematic. I, I, I think that I, I, su I suspect that there's a fundamental flaw in how these big projects work and that they never going to happen in the rate at which the time at which they think they're going to take and the ability for things to go wrong expands within that time. And there's a communicate. It's like, you know, there was a book written like 40 years ago called The Mythical Man Month, which was all about how problematic it is to develop large software projects. And people, you just throw more people at it and it gets more complex. And that's why like Windows took forever. Like, oh, we'll throw 5,000 more engineers into it. Like, no, that'll make it worse. There's a lot of stuff done about engineering and stuff. And you have like, you know, they have like the different sort of approaches about like, you know, how you're supposed to get things done faster or leaner or different methods for stuff. But I don't know if they really, that was like Boeing had the problem with 727. I forgot what the method is that they use. I, it just escapes me right now. But then everybody works on their separate thing. And then you try to integrate every all the systems later on. And then all of a sudden you find out, oh, this thing doesn't really work. Nobody does projects at this scale very often. And they always seem to fall apart. And, and it is worth noting that when it's a government project, you know, that has the U.S. logo and the U.S you know, direct backing of, as you mentioned, senators and so on, uh, it does not have the luxury of being subsidized by other companies' failures. So, like, um, there was a time when, let's say, there's six, seven different players uh, you know, trying to make it to orbit, and we still are covering stories from some of those those failures, you know, Virgin, uh, not a failure, but, but like, for example, Virgin Galactic has a long way to go, Paul Allen's uh, uh, company that got folded and then rebought um, uh, Blue Origin, you know, has yet to have anything that appears to be able to get to orbit or whatever. It's so tempting for us to simply focus on like SpaceX did it. Why can't you do it? Because um, no, nobody could have known 15 years ago which of these com individual private uh, attempts would be successes and which would be failures. And if you have the luxury of painting a target after the bullets hit the barn, then, yeah, you're going to have a bullseye every time. And that, that, I would, that, that's a bit of the illusion that I don't want to fall for when it comes to judging NASA against private industry. I, well, I would say that I would say that the approach, I would argue to say that like the SpaceX approach was figure out how to build working prototypes faster, like build, build metal, get metal on the, on the launch pad faster. I would say that if you would ask me 15 years ago, which approach would I bet on? I, I would have bet on that because... The problem is the complexity increases. Even you can, on paper, you can say, like SLS is an example of we're using, it's 40-year-old technology and they can't get it to work because, well, we have these, we use 40-year-old technology, it's dependable. And like when they built those first, the boot, each engine had like a Motorola 686 processor in it, hmm. right? Um, now they're using much bigger processors. Like, well, we'll swap this out and this out. And it's like, 
okay, but now, you know, you need to test that. You need to do a lot of iterations and testing. Like, no, no, we know the booster works. And it's like, and I would kind of argue like, yeah, it is hard to sort of, in hindsight, I'd say that like, I would, I mean, I, the SpaceX approach to me, if you have the money to keep going, I think that is the better approach. Cause it's like, just build stuff, build stuff, build stuff. Sure. And, and, and we also, I, I suppose what I'm trying to acknowledge is that we have the benefit of comparing the winner of a tournament with many, many players against a single player. And, and, and I, well, I, I, well, I, no, I, yeah, that, I, 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 I would, I, but just, that approach has been used by everybody in the aerospace that NASA's done, and that's been what's problematic. James Webb, all of that. That's my argument to say is like, we kept doing that approach. It's why we didn't do any innovation in 40 years. Sorry, Justin. Uh, yeah, I think that there were, there were signs that were there, but ultimately what we need to kind of look at is just the difference in what these processes are. One is, you know, the SLS was something that we were making fun of when it got approved because it, it seemed like a gigantic aerospace boondoggle for, uh, you know, war, uh, you know, defense industry mainstays that were all going to uh, uh, combine together and create something that was already, even at the time that it was approved, like a couple of years behind the times in terms of what you would want to have a design based on the time frame of when it would come out. So the fact that it has not worked is, is, you know, more to me of a sign of of that kind of project having to come together as opposed to one singular vision. And really, ultimately, this might hopefully, in 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 terms of space exploration and for NASA, this is them realizing that, hey, buying finished products is better than us trying to build all of this ourselves because they're not really building it themselves. They're contracting with people anyway and and those people that they're contracting with might not be the best contractors to do exactly what they want to do yeah this uh this project definitely when we heard about it it was if you were to write um uh not quite a parody but but like uh, a, a, a just a gut instinct of like what would a government 2.0 of a space shuttle program look like it would be exactly what this is i yeah. Yeah, I, it's, it is hard. It absolutely, it's hard to Brian. It is hard to point and to say this company succeed or this company is going to fail. I, I totally agree. I, I think that my bias kind of comes in and like, whenever we look at these really big defense projects, whether it's Navy ships and stuff like this, and you look at where the incentives are, you're like, I think we can make a prediction of who's not going to be first across the finish line and who's not incentivized to. Yeah, um, and I think the incentives like is an important part, and I suppose that's what I was trying to bring up with the the the, the sense that I I assume people at NASA feel so squeezed because uh, when when you have unlimited budget, unlimited momentum, unlimited popularity for you know your moonshot, uh, you get to you you do get to be bold, crazy, spend a lot of money, and let a lot of things blow up with no penalties. Um, and uh, there, the NASA is simply after the, the, the Challenger is not now, or after the Challenger and uh, 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 what was it for Columbia, um, they were simply no longer in that position uh, where they, they no longer got to fail. When you don't get to fail, it changes the way you play the game. And, and uh, so, I don't know, it's a bummer. Yeah, yeah. And it's in it, I would say it's kind of frustrating though. It's like the main contractor for SLS is Boeing. And, Boeing is so tied into our defense industry and so many other things. Yet, and part of the reason this exists is because of Boeing lobbyists. I mean, it's really the influence they have over politicians and what they're able to do. And, and it's it's one of these we got like NASA should do this, and you have NASA is responsible to the United States government and Congress. I mean, that that's the end of the day who decides this stuff. And you know, a handful of senators control and shape this. That's so interesting because you're favorites. right with the incentives, like. It's not like they're going to sell more ordnance missiles by delivering humans safely to space. It's not like they're going to go up and somebody's like, well, I wasn't, I was on the fence about you handing this defense contract to Boeing, but now that you sent humans to orbit or around the moon or what have you, now I'm really going to give you money. That would never happen. However, failure, any failure would be totally catastrophic in a, in a defense budget committee meeting. I, you, you'd think, but like, you know, you have, you look at, you start looking at the number of failures Boeing and Lockheed have had, you know? Oh, and, yeah. 
I mean, it, it, and I guess that's, you know, the, 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 the thing that I really want to separate with this is we, we keep saying like NASA, NASA, NASA. And when we say NASA, the branding of NASA, especially in, in what happened in like the period between 1985 and 2005 is we, we began to understand NASA was just, it's Houston. It's, uh, of the the guy with the crazy hair that land the Mars rover, it's scientists and everything, and and I like that idea of NASA. That's a good branding of NASA, but also it it's the shield for let's have all of these gigantic defense contractors build these like decade long time frame projects that are always over budget, that always under deliver, and by the time that they actually get to to the launch pad, are woefully behind what we could have done. And that's what I would just kind of like to separate is that, is that this is not the, you know, when, when, when we say the NASA way of doing things, it's, you know, by the time that it gets to the people that we think of as NASA, uh, all these decisions are already made. They're, they're handed this hardware and, and they get much less of a say about it than I think we, 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 we process through our minds. This is Lockheed. This is Boeing. You know, a, a big problem, we've talked about this before, is the sunk cost fallacy, which is you think, oh, I've already invested this much, it'd be a bad idea to quit now. This was supposed to launch in 2016. Five years behind, a real, the idea there's going to be a launch this year seems less realistic. And that's unfortunately in government programs, the longer you go and the more money that gets thrown at you, the likelihood you're going to get more money thrown at you, even if you have it delivered. And that is, you wonder if like we need to emphasize the thing, like if you're more than three years behind, no matter what, even it's because, oh, we couldn't secure funding from the Senate or whatever, that's a sign the project doesn't have enough legs to go, whether it's technically in the right place or whatever. And and that's, it's, the sad thing is what it costs us is that, you know, we can go like, oh, but, you know, this kept engineers employed and all this, like, yes, and it kept them from working on things that would work, you know, it kept them from working on things that would be, would, you know, contribute to overall productivity and efficiency and, you know, the amount of money spent on SLS, every one of us, we go pay our taxes. It's not, it's you can measure it in the cents and dollars. Oh, yeah. really? So it's not insignificant. Yeah. I mean, you know, so far SLS, uh, I mean, ISS was a hundred billion dollars. SLS total budget now is like SLS total budget. I'm going to look this up. It's just insane. Yeah, we're seeing SLS eighteen point six billion. Eighteen point six billion, yeah. So per per or two point five billion a year in twenty twenty. Oh, good God. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think I'm glad we're entering a world where we have very very competent options for the people that we that we understand when we say NASA and we think of the control room and we think of the research and we think of the science and we think of uh, uh, all that. I'm glad that my, my bias has always been to getting them the best tools possible. And I feel like we are, we are at a point now where we're clearly differentiating the idea of re good, reliable tools versus unreliable tools and and i think that that's that's a that is a step forward yeah it's this you got to figure like this costs the average american like 25 dollars a year in your taxes wow Ugh. man <laughs> that's money that you could have spent there at patreon.com slash weird thing nailed it patreon.com slash weird things is where you support successful this show uh uh here's something I, I've said it a million times. Go get your custom RSS feed. Uh, I was doing with this with another show that I do that has a Patreon, and I know somebody who is extremely tech literate. And I had to stand over him and his cell phone because he didn't know how to get his custom RSS feed, like as if I were trying to show my mom email for the first time. <laughs> like, so here's what you do. You sign up uh, on, for the Patreon, and then... Uh, sometimes you get an email, but if you don't, just go back to patreon.com slash weird things once you've logged in. On that page, you'll see your custom RSS feed. Enter that to the podcatcher of your choice. I actually just went back and did this with a couple things that I hadn't uh, uh, uploaded my, my, my custom RSS feed for, and I am thrilled I did. It is uh, the best part of that platform, and it's the best part 
uh, for your best way for you to get the After Things podcast, which comes out earlier. So uh, go ahead and do that right now. Patreon.com slash weird thing. So on some positive news in space, and also let me point out that a number of these pro things I'm going to mention were given support from NASA. You know, NASA has helped support SpaceX, Blue Origin, and other companies. There are initiatives there. There are people that understand that, you know, we need to work with other space companies, et cetera, outside of just the mainstays. And so I'm going to mention some things and think about this is, uh, I think, things that have benefited tremendously from NASA. I don't want to be like just ripping into NASA because, like, I think... NASA buying of itself with more autonomy and able to do stuff would probably be pretty amazing. So over the weekend, uh, Blue Origin, or uh, this week, rather, Blue Origin was able to, they tested their new crew capsule, which is going to go on top of their uh, Shepard booster, which is their, it's a suborbital, but it does go above the Kármán line, which is a line of, line of space. So this thing goes, you know, a few thousand miles an hour up goes up there and people get would be able to be in weightlessness. There was nobody on board, but they showed the actual capsule design. It's got big, huge windows. So it's very much a tourist type experience. Have, have we so, heard anything from Blue Origin that that isn't implying that that I, I and, and let me let me clarify before I even say this. Uh, I assume that when you get into to, uh, rocketry, you're not doing it just for tourists. But I understand why you might just make that your only stated goal, knowing that there'll be ancillary benefits down the road. Are, have we gotten to a, a payload to orbit, uh, even whisper from Blue Origin yet? Well, remember, they also build the BE-4 engines, uh, which are going to be used to power with United Launch Alliance. So those are going to be used for that. So they've been developing the, those are uh, methane engines. And so they develop those, and those are going to be on board the Vulcan, the Vulcan Center, uh, Centaur rocket. So um, we could see something pretty soon where basically their engines power another space vehicle. And that feels that feels like imagine that essentially you're taking, a, you know, an awesome trip to Astro World, so to speak, you know, some kind of six flags experience. Uh, but what you're really doing is subsidizing the research that is eventually going to let humanity bust out of this Petri dish. That feels like a morally rad thing to do if you have money to set fire to. Yeah, and, and I would say that their strategy, they started before SpaceX, and they're clearly nowhere near as far along as SpaceX is in, in a lot of ways you would measure sort of success. That being said, the BE-4 engine, if it gets used in the, you know, the Vulcan rocket, it gets used there. They're going to be building the capability, and they're very powerful. The BE-4s are amazing engines. Um, you know, that's, you know, space right now, it's about engines, you know, it's engines and we're now getting more into chassis and things like that for usability. So it'll be helpful all around, but I would love to see them build their own space vehicle, but no. Oh. Do, do you think there's, um, I, I assume that there's barring some kind of like revolutionary new fuel or engine or whatever. I assume that a single stage to orbit just uh, will that I, I uh, actually, uh, there, there's no way. Smarter people than me have asked the question, is there a single stage to orbit possible? You know, it, I mean, it is possible. Like, you could you could probably take the Starship I guess for, for, for a small, yeah, small enough payload. Yeah, yeah. And that's, and Brian, that's it, is the idea is it's like so much of your, your, your engines and your fuel tanks and all that are designed to get you past, you know, the, the first, you know, to get you up to a certain amount of velocity. And after that, you don't need them. And why, why drag them with you? And, you know, so, and I, there's an elegance to single stage, but you think now with automation and you think about how trains work, you know, think about like you get in a train, you don't worry if the locomotive switches and you switch parts or components because we've been doing this for a hundred years. <laughs> and, and that's a pretty good way to put it. It's just like, why does the coal have to be in just a coal car? And why do the people have to just be in a people car? When, <laughs> why, when are we going to make a single stage train that has everything in it? Yeah, well, it's called a car, Brian. Okay. Turns out not as efficient <laughs> as a train. Uh, and I was, that was, in, and that's, in, a, in, in that lack of, let's say that lack of elegance to, it certainly bothers Elon Musk, but he announced what they're going to do with the, uh, they're trying to do now with the the the, the, the heavy booster for the Starship, um, the, the booster stage, 
he wants it to land exactly back on the launch pad without even, even having any landing legs. And one of the things they're talking about, the idea is like having the grid fins catch on to something. So basically that booster would come back down and just land right where it came off from. And they'd be which, ready to go straight off again, which again, it's not exactly elegant the way a, a Boeing 737 pulls up to the jet port, you know, with, with somebody, you know, like there's no side view mirrors or whatever, you know, you have to have somebody direct, but, but ultimately it, it gets the job done. Uh, even if that was a little bit kludgy, that, that turnaround time, I mean, you could tell uh, when, when he's already adopting the Southwest airlines model of, you know, we need faster turnaround times uh, that that's, 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 that's far reaching thought. Yeah. And it's, and it's really good you know, it's really good economist thinking, you know, it's that, hey, I have an asset. How do I make this asset as inexpensive as possible? I use it as much as I can. Like, you know, like the you know, Southwest and other airlines realized, oh, well, if we can keep our planes in the air, if, if they can handle the, the wear, the wear is not going to bother them and we can keep them in the air all the time, then they're cheaper. And, you know, and, yeah. and they were willing, so in the Southwest Airlines example, they were willing to um, in a world where uh, during during price controls and 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 government uh, uh, restrictions on how many flights you could do or whatever, they uh, uh, w and and all the prices were fixed. Airlines could only kind of compete on the glamour of being part of the jet set. That's why I used to get you know China and your meal on there and all that stuff. Uh, uh, once that went away and it became about like, hey, we're only making money when we're moving people. Then it was like as unglamorous as it is. Just, just get in the line. We don't care where you sit. It's a bus. Just go, and uh, and and that yeah. worked uh, against them in a world where business travelers wanted to be glamorous, and so they had to position themselves as the airline for everybody. You know, spend spend. You know, you probably have this much in your wallet right now. Go. And it wasn't until the early aughts that they really made a play for uh, business travel. Um, it, it's it's really a fascinating history. Yeah. Yeah, the airline business. There was a, a great book too. If I ever get a chance to read one on uh, JetBlue too, and in in you know one of the advantages that new airlines have over older airlines is older airlines your flight crews are older, and so your pay your salaries are higher and your pension payouts are higher, et cetera. And yeah, they, you know, they, they just they a lot have, of weird dynamics. Uh, and I think we had a Justin and I were talking about this on a happy hour or something. We were talking about the entanglements of of some airlines with a. Uh, uh, union labor and, and existing agreements and that kind of stuff. And, and uh, we had a, a, a fan of the show write in and, and give us more of the details behind the scenes on that. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating, but uh, complex. Complicated. But, um, complicated. Over yeah. our pay grade, one might say. Yeah. Although we can. And get our to heads, because <laughs> they're flying. <laughs> they're good. Nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah. So in other news, uh, which is cool, is Virgin Orbit. Remember, there's Virgin Galactic, and there's Virgin Orbit, and uh, a lot of Virgins out there. Virgin, Gal Virgin Orbit is the one that's actually using, they have a Cosmic Girl, which is their big airplane that they use to launch rockets from. They actually achieved orbit. They've earned the orbit title their name. They launched a rocket with a satellite payload. They tried this back oh. in May, and oh, they just same title. I didn't even read this headline. That's hilarious. <laughs> Eric uh, Eric Berger writes, "Our Ars Tech at Virgin Orbit just earned the orbit part of its name." <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, was, I swear I wasn't copying that. Um, so, any event, um, that's kind of exciting news. Is that um, they've actually now what they do is they take they have a rocket. It's mounted underneath a big airplane. That airplane goes up to a high altitude. And then the rocket deploys and then takes off from there and then heads off into space. It's so funny it because that's the kind of thought that I had as a child. And I understand like uh, the reason they would put a space shuttle on the back of a, you know, Boeing jet or whatever uh, was, was either to, you know, test it to, to glide on down or to move it from point A to point B and so on. And there was some part of my child brain that was like, Seems like if you wanted to go to space, you should already be most of the way there and then launch off of that. And to see that become a reality uh, as, as I creep up to my 50s is, is amazing. Well, Brian, it was a reality before you were born, though. The, uh, the Pegasus rockets uh, you had and remember, you know, Chuck Yeager when he was uh, just, you know, sc you know, scraping along the edge of space. Those were all launched from airplanes. So, um, uh you know, that was actually some of the first ways they tried to do stuff was like, let's just launch it from a plane. Yeah. Of course, 
Of course, remember well, Moonraker, and, and too. I guess, yeah, we also got that with, uh, with uh, Virgin Galactic's uh, when they acquired uh, uh, Burt Rutan's uh, Spaceship One. Uh, same, similar thing. Mm -hmm. And remember Moonraker. Oh, I never saw it. Who can forget Moonraker? Brian can, because he never saw it. That yeah. was where they uh, decide. They have this Richard Branson, Elon Musk character before either one of them were real personalities in those fields, or even Elon. You know, Elon's probably just born, but there's a plan to steal this space shuttle, and it's on top of an airplane. And basically, there's a some pilots hiding on board the space shuttle, and they take off from the top of the airplane and steal it. That's awesome. It's very different from the book. <laughs> um, so it's cool. I would say that it's 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 a frustrating, and you know, SLS the it seems to be you know, not going in the direction we'd like it to. It would be great to have this other system, this sort of you know reliable system that's capable of doing this. We're going to see what's going to happen. You know, we're days away from new administrations coming in. Uh, the Senate, you know, now the change up of the the Senate. Sh Richard Shelby, or Shelby, who is the senator from Alabama, who is part of the big reason that. SLS exists and why it's all built in Alabama is because of him. Well, no longer in the majority power in the Senate. And so mm. let's see what's going to happen there. What's it going to mean for the rest of, you know, NASA, et cetera. And I yeah. don't know. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm at a point with space travel where we've seen enough results from enough players that it's a, it is a put up or shut up, uh, uh, world right now if you want to play in, in in the rocket game you know to me spacex set such a lead dog example of where you need to be to 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 play the game and i know we would love we all love more options i'm here for reliable tools i don't believe that the sls is or will be a reliable tool for nasa and i i am i i, I have to suppress a wry smile to when i see it fail yeah and I don't, you know, and again, for it, it's, we don't really have a clear idea what's going to be, you know, the, the, the incoming administration's plan for space in general and where they want to do. And uh, neither party really is known for disrupting the, tr the traditional old school partners. So um, it's, it might just be yeah. more of the same. We'll see. Well, I, yeah, I think the, uh, yeah. the, 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 the metaphor that I'm hopeful for, and, and I think I first heard it about a decade ago from you, Andrew, where it's like, we don't expect the United States Postal Service to also build the vehicles that deliver the mail. And, and that's where we want to be with NASA. And I really, I'm really hopeful for that. I don't, I don't, I don't care who, who builds the engines as long as they go. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the one thing I would well, say... The one, the one thing I would say is that now we have a public idea of what goes into this in a way that we hadn't before. You know, like Elon Musk is a very famous person. SpaceX is a very famous company. Jeff Bezos in, is a very famous person in Blue Origin. Jeff is, who? You know, yeah, exactly. Um, so if we're in a world where the richest people in the world are putting these things together, then even as... Uh, uh, as as you pointed out, Andrew, things are unlikely to change because nobody in Washington really wants to change anything. Everybody in Washington just kind of wants to keep their jobs forever. Uh, then, you know, the one substitute to that is public pressure. And now at least there's people that know what these things are. They know that, oh, I saw the SpaceX thing land the rocket. That was cool looking. Does this thing do that or does it not? Like that is public pressure that I don't think that really has been part of any kind of public or congressional decision on space ever. Like, you know, because but to, to, to get into it, it was, hey, here's a blank check from Uncle Sam. Get us to the moon before the Ruskies. And, and now it's like, well, then we went through decades and decades of, of everybody throwing their hands up and saying, ah, guess space is too expensive. Uh, and and now we're at a point where, oh, look, this is options. Big, public, hard-to-ignore options. Yep. Gentlemen, do you want to pick? Yeah, I got a pick. Uh, let me get the exact name of it. But uh, if not this exact app, uh, certainly the experience. My pick is the experience of watching the International Space Station rise over the horizon 
exactly on cue. There's a number of different satellite tracker apps. Um, I believe this one that I downloaded was called ISS Starlink. It's like the AR stuff is we've talked about AR uh, with Apple devices uh, in the past. Man, it's so precise right now. It's a really great time to get into backyard astronomy. It's a great time to uh, I, I want to do it again, uh, seeing if I could spot uh, a bunch of um, uh, the the uh, oh, iridium satellites uh, uh, for the first time ever. I finally caught in the telescope Mercury. It's a great time to uh, while you still can go outside and and see the stars. Uh, we were talking about how uh, Brant told me the other day that uh, one third of humanity is unable to see the Milky Way, full stop, because of light pollution. And that's only going to get worse. So right now we're at a pretty sweet spot where if you're outside of the city, you uh, you are going to be able to find all the interesting objects and see them easier than before. Highly recommended experience. And I cool. think the full name of that app is Starlink and ISS NASA Tracker. Yeah, that sounds right. That's the that's the icon that I saw. Yeah, I think they shorten it on the on the home screen. But this is for Starlink satellites and ISS. And and I did find a number of them, or or any of those, uh, you know, Sky Tour apps. So worth it. It is it is neat. Where one of my favorite things to do is like go out to Joshua Tree, which is if you look, you can find you can look at a map called Dark Sky Territory. And of course, part of the reason why one third can't see the Milky Way is because cities which right. you know the push for urban living but you go out to there and it is neat because you just lay there on a moonless night and you just see little things flitting overhead and it is it's great for seeing a meteor shower but just to even watch the little little specks and satellites and stuff and sometimes it's neat to not even know what it is but you just see all kinds of weird things nice it's got a map of dark sky places right here which is pretty cool yeah and that is, yeah, the first time, I think the first time I really ever noticed the Milky Way is maybe, and I'd been camping and stuff as a kid, but probably never bothered to look up, but probably on a cruise ship at night, just looking up and all of a sudden and seeing, holy cow, that's a lot of stars. <laughs> that's a lot of stars. Uh, hey, I got a pick and it involves three stars that I was unfamiliar with. <laughs> uh, uh, Andrew recommended to me the Bee Gees documentary on hbo how do you mend a broken heart uh and you know i tweeted this that like when andrew recommended it to me with high praise i was like i don't really care about disco who cares <laughs> whatever i want the bgs they get an hour and a half into this like two hour and 15 minute documentary before they even get to saturday night fever and everything that led up to it they had this like, you know how in like Spinal Tap when when they they show that Spinal Tap's been around forever and they were like Beatles ripoffs and then they were you know like these like hippie ripoffs before they became a metal band, they're like a good version of that. Like they did credible folk, they did credible soul, they, like everything that they touched, they did extraordinarily well because everything can be aided by these three brothers who have this blood harmony of of their voices and, and and can meld it really well but also i was unaware that they were the songwriters behind everything that that they that they constructed everything so it's like i came in not giving a rat's ass about the Bee Gees, and i left thinking like are they the greatest band of all time like are they <laughs> like if you, if you stack up the fact that like they've been doing it for as for longer than anybody else that we would consider the greatest band of all time that they oftentimes you know uh of uh, they wrote all their own stuff, which many of the greatest bands of all time did not like they're kind of in a, like also receiving votes situation after watching this documentary. I loved it. There's multiple times in there where, cause you, they get into the pre Beatle, the pre Bee Gees era. And you're like, I know that song. I didn't know that was a Bee Gees song and they wrote it, you know, and then you get into the Bee Gees era, of course, and how, how that sound came about is fascinating there's a lot of examples of like you know way before like yeah we were waiting to go into the studio to record the lights went out and that's when we came up with the song new york new york mining disaster which became a hit you know and then they're like oh you know you know i had to go over a bridge every day and i heard this rhythm and that became the rhythm for i won't spoil it for you so many of these like oh i we saw this thing and all of a sudden it became this 
And then when they you look at the songwriting phase, like, wait, they wrote that song? They wrote that song? And then you're like, holy cow, they I was not a fan before. I'm very much a fan now. Yeah, no, great. And the documentary is very smart in who they pull for their uh their like off their their talking head interviews. Uh, they get a lot of brothers, people in brother bands. So they get Noel Gallagher from Oasis. They get uh, one of the Jonas brothers when they're talking Nick. about uh, uh, gigantic backlashes to bands. Uh, they have Chris Martin of Coldplay and he's like talking about it. So they're, it, it's, it's informed. It is, it is, uh, there, there's ne- there's very rarely a time that there's like a wasted celebrity talking head and they always kind of feel like they are uh, uh expressing an element of their own story that that the Bee Gees really personified uh, uh it is it's great it, it, it is really an exceptional music documentary it's directed by frank marshall the director who's you know kathleen kennedy's husband um and uh, very well done. They use a lot of footage from there was an Annie biography documentary from 1999 when all three brother, brothers were alive. And so they use a footage, a lot of footage from that, you know, to get kind of the other brothers' perspectives. And I thought they did it really well because you can then go watch that documentary too. And they do address there was one glaring hole in this documentary where they never talk about because they go through like the whole, you know, Bee Gees, you know, at the height of popularity, all the things going on, and then kind of the backlash. But they leave out a little movie <gasps> called Sergeant, Sergeant Pepper's, Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Yeah. Yep. It ne- never I- gets mentioned. Never gets mentioned. And it's like, that's a little bit, you know, you're going to go cover the Beatles. Eh. Yeah. So, so. The um, any biography was, they go into, was, like, how horrible Was that a black was. eye on, on either of their careers? Or why? I, I, I've never seen the movie. Um, I did always find it odd that it would be the PGs portraying the titular well, they characters. Have, you, when you go back into the history and you realize like they had the same management company, all same, there was a lot of overlap with them and the Beatles were a few years ahead of them. There was a lot of overlap. They were friends with them. And there was, there was a big tight Cause we just think of, you know, our generation, we think of Bee Gees, we just think of staying alive, the high pitched songs and not thinking of early stage when they were contemporary to the Beatles and doing, you know, their own thing. I would say that that the problem was, is that at the point where, they started to have hits like from Jive Talking on Forward. They had the new sound and disco became popular. They were in heavy, heavy rotation. And then they do like Children of the World album. And then they do the Saturday Night, Saturday Night Fever album comes out, like the biggest selling album of all time. And then there's Beatles, or Beatles, Bee Gees everywhere. Then, oh, by the way, here they are in a movie covering Beatles songs was probably just people's brains would just went to overload. Like, okay, enough. <laughs> enough, enough, yeah. There is, there's a moment in the documentary that I think is is appropriate for this documentary because it's, it, it this is about the the Bee Gees, but they they delve into it a little bit of the 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 disco sucks phenomenon, yeah, the backlash, the, the the backlash to disco, and taking a a look at that from our modern perspective where we have seen situations where people have you know uh, used popular uh art like star wars or video games i'm just using as an example uh to have a you know whether or not it is intended a larger cultural conversation is kind of a proxy war yeah like 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 like, look man um uh, i can't even tell you the two sides in guatemala all i know is that's the battleground between us and the ussr and whether or not the people that are fighting it are that are on the front lines, they're like, no, I just think that the, they play the Bee Gees on the radio too much. Like, not that I'm denigrating the popularization of a art form that is loved by women and my and and gays. Like, I'm it, I don't care about that. I just don't like Barry Gibbs high voice. And and it's like there's a lot that goes on. They, and and I think that that there I, I would I would I would like to see kind of a further exploration when in looking at these kinds of, of moments. But I thought it was interesting to, you know, in, in this story, they, they get a little bit into the cultural element, uh, element of it, but mostly it's just juxtaposed with the fact that the Bee Gees in their own world 
are gods. They're going on the biggest tour that they've ever had. They've got a custom plane. They're playing uh, the, what is now the O.co or Oracle Arena right down the street from me. Three nights in a row. As soon as we, as soon as you start, the opening shot is them in Oakland, and I'm like, oh, let me look up what they did. Three nights. Three nights sold out in in that uh, uh, basketball arena, and I presume it was only because they couldn't play the football arena, which is where they were playing in in some of the other stops. So, uh, uh, just just insane, great, and man, the music is rad. Like the music's really good. Uh, I gotta pick. Uh, I'll keep this kind of short and sweet because I think it's I think it's good, not great. Uh, we're starting to watch uh, WandaVision for its spoiler in time, which uh, the first two episodes just came out on Friday. And I think this is a, a neat little, uh, a, an interesting thing. They're, they're uh, you know, it's Wanda and Vision from the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And they seem to just wake up in, uh, in an old style sitcom. And uh, why are they there? And, and how does it happen? And uh, they're, they're, they really kind of, only hint at the edges of like them actually thinking it's it's a strange position to be in uh let alone trying to figure it out um i i thought this was was kind of neat the first two episodes are kind of presented in a like a black and white sitcom and uh it seems like they're gonna try and do a lot of different styles of sitcom um over the season they're and they're slowly moving through the years so the first one very much bewitched uh you know the second one uh you know, a, a slightly more town focused uh, show, but it seems like they are slowly to moving. In. Yeah. 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 At the slowly end of the second episode, more. you see suddenly they're in color and well, yeah. you're onto a different. Yeah. I, I um, I, I kind of dig it. I love it. Like, and, I love and, it and, so and much. I, and, and the and slower I, and they I, roll it, the, the more yeah. impressed I get. Like it, it felt, it felt like a, like a weird comic series mm -hmm. where they're like which it's like, based no. on oh it is based on okay good oh. so yeah so i it, it just it felt like just like one of those weird runs where it's like no we're gonna let you sit in the dark for a while we're not gonna tell you exactly what it is but mm -hmm. there's a million ways that you can that you can uh take it from there uh uh the the the, the callbacks are obviously very intricate uh you know, I don't know. I was just, I, I watched And when I watched it, I was like, eh, like could have used some kind of framing of like, you know, cause at a certain point through, through the first episode, you're like, are they really just cosplaying as bewitched? We're just doing mm -hmm. a cause a bewitched cosplay thing. And, like, and, and I, I liked that part of it the most. Like I don't particularly care about Wanda or vision in the Marvel cinematic universe. I think they are the two most milk toast people on those entire crews. Um, so I think this is a really interesting way to give them Have a lot of Hawkeye? character. Uh, uh, also, <laughs> he's up there. He's up there. Don't worry. He's up there. He's a, he's a sociopath. Though, you know, so you know that he's the sociopathic one. Um, so I like kind of giving them something to do and giving them a lot of direction. The only thing is, because when I, you know, you go to the uh, the listing for it on Disney Plus, and it's a, and it says, you know, um, uh, superhero and drama and mystery, and I went, oh well, if this is a mystery, obviously it's going to be someone's under a spell or someone's in a coma, or, right? There's like not a, I I feel like as I've, in I've, terms I've of dug, a ming a mystery, I've dug, I've dug around the edges. Because I, I said, as soon as I watched the first two, I'm like, I'm not going to go on the internet. I'm not going to go on the internet because everyone's going to have everything explained and they're going to mm -hmm. know where it came from. And and so I haven't, I glanced. I haven't subscribed to the WandaVision subreddit, but uh -huh. I have I have glanced at the page. There's some really cool things if, if, so, if, if where this is going is where people are hinting. I, I, I would say... Oh, go ahead. Well, just the... I, I would love to be surprised with a very out of left field mystery here, but I see the little Marvel badge on it. And I think, well, she's going to be in, she got really upset and she's made she's a big space. She's in psychic or, prison. She's in a big tube and they were keeping her in the tube. And I, I hope that it breaks out of that. Um, and right now the show is good and it's keeping me on for the value of the show. But if this is a mystery, boy, I need it to be more than the bad She's guy has a crystal. Yeah. yeah. I, I, um, I never read the comic that it's, in, I think that it's inspired from, but I kind of sort of 
saw like artwork on the premise, but I will say that in this, the second episode at the end, huge, huge clue, huge clear yeah. clue about what's going on. And and to, you know, Bryce, whatever, like I think that's kind of evident as far as like what's part of part of it. And I don't I I I just if it wraps up nicely, I'm very happy. I love I really the more I think about it, the more I love this because it's so different. Mm-hmm. It is Marvel saying, we'll take a chance or we're going to be a little bit bolder in our storytelling. In each one of those, the first one is a 50s style, is a very much a 50s style sitcom because the beds are separated. The second yeah. one is 60s because then the, the beds symbolically come together and other the styles and stuff to that. Sure. Each one of those was very faithfully sort of done, even to the point that like, I was laughing because the one they did in the 60s, they used the most generic location that you can to have a neighborhood, which is at the end yeah. of my block. Oh, really? And that's, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the Warner Brothers ranch. And so, you know, that's the funny part. I'm like, I'm like, I know that, you know, and then it's, I walk by there every day, the back of their house. And so, oh, but nice. and it's great because you would never use that in a normal Marvel movie. You would never go use this so plainly look like Hollywood back lot and then the the town square is universal that's uh hill valley the gazebo uh, all of yeah, that, yeah. where they do also the magic uh, show. Uh, uh, dukes of hazard is where i remember it most from yeah mm-hmm. yep yep hazard so but i thought each one of those as a parody of that kind of sitcom they managed to do the parody really well and still be funny and entertaining and not look at how stupid this is but more let's try to work within the trope of this let's have a little bit more drama of these characters who have their sort of issues and they're entertaining i was very entertained i'm ready to go watch them again yeah so yeah no i the the further i got away from it the more i was excited about it mostly because what what price said like look i think that there there is going to be an element of of disappointed fans who want the normal marvel every episode ends with the punch and a kick and uh, a glowing spire in the sky and, and somebody making up a, 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 a wink to the camera kind of reference. Uh, but you know, that's, I, I, I get that in a movie when you got two hours and people are there to see certain beats get hit. So you got to figure out new ways to hit them in a television show. Be a little crazier. Be a little, be a little and, nuttier, and you know, and, and that's what I love. I love, yeah. the, especially because they look, Paul Bettany is a great actor and he's, he seems like he is just you know, thrilled to be playing this like wacky sitcom version of, uh, of, of, of a robot and, pretending to be a man, <laughs> of a robot <laughs> pretending to be a man, pretending to be Darren from bewitched. And, and then on the other side, Elizabeth Olsen is somebody that, based on where I'm assuming this story is going to go is, is really going to be the linchpin of this, like, you know, parody plus twin peaks plus sci-fi Marvel kind of thing. That is, that is happening. I'm, I'm, I don't know. The further I got away from it, the more I really dug it. I, my kind of my summation on my point on this, this is the first real Marvel TV show we've seen from the MCU, the movie team. We've had the other yeah. stuff, the TV stuff, which I never got into, always thought it was just amateurish and never thought the writing was really particularly strong. And it was just dumb thing after dumb thing. That you, and people are like, oh, you should watch it. I'm like, I'm like, well, they break into a facility and they just kill security guards or innocent people. Like, yeah, but I'm like, how many dumb things are you going to ask me to forgive? How many dumb things before a thing becomes dumb? And, and that was my problem with the other Marvel shows. The Netflix stuff I thought was was good was was better, but then it just sort of went you know off a off a thing. But this is the first like really let's integrate this into the use our main characters, our main story, get the same sort of teams that we'd use for film stuff. I think it's off to a great start, and it's because it's trying to be something different. It's not trying to be you know a Marvel movie cut into ten pieces. Yeah. Uh, did you have a pick, Andrew? My pick is. The pick I'm about to pick. Um, no, uh, have you guys seen Wayne? Uh, on I Amazon have Pro? not, but I I do know that our 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 friend Meryl Barr is a a proselytizer for for the Church of Wayne. So so if you, if you liked it, then then that will be two 
opinions I trust that I would like I would I would have to investigate. I am going to be the for the Burbank chapter of the Church of Wayne. My dad told me, "Oh, you should see Wayne." Um Wayne is about a 16-year-old kid from Massachusetts who is very moral but very violent, has a very very troubled background and kind of goes on the run. Uh and it is a a it's comedic, it's violent, it's funny, the characters are amazing. There is one of the greatest speeches I've ever heard in TV happened in an episode with a character who's this <laughs> you'll when you get there, you'll probably get there. Um I cannot recommend it enough. Oh and uh I've the, seen an the, episode the of girl, this. Yeah. Uh, uh, this yeah, used to be the, on on YouTube Premium. This was a YouTube Premium show for the first season, and yeah, was it? Yeah, yeah I thought we it, talked about it on Cord Killers briefly. Uh, well, it's on Amazon Prime now. Nice. The girlfriend's father, the super violent uh, guy, is played by Dean Winter, and so uh, Dean Winters, you know, uh, from the Beeper, you know, Beeper salesman Dean Winters. And, oh, the Beeper King. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. He is in his, he's got these two twin sons that are like, you know, like got like the Southie sort of accents that are like idiots and every character in there is sort of a delight. Um, and then sometimes surprising. And it is, I, I cannot recommend the show enough. Um, it's just, just very, very fun. Nice. So I'm glad that got picked up. I, it seems like a, a, like Cobra Kai, you know, went over to, uh, to Netflix. Netflix, so it, it, it's it's good to see YouTube Premium had a couple of good things, and I'm glad to see some of these other shows getting picked up and revived. I hope they do a second season. I hope Amazon decides to pick that up. I way way better than Cobra Kai. Way better than Cobra Kai. It's just wow. There's it's just uh, it's really good. So cool. Awesome. And, uh, Try to look at the staff who wrote it, but anyhow, um, gentlemen, it's been weird. Nice. All right, we'll take a few minutes here and get ready for after things. Cool, cool. Uh, so if you need to take a break, getting a ready time. for after things. Gotta talk more <laughs> after things. <laughs> 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 Um, they don't understand justin but they will i know <laughs> oh my god the bg's rule god they rule and also there's like this bonus element because they moved to miami so there's all this like late uh, 70s early 80s south florida stuff that is just like just nostalgia okay. just like inject it like right into in, in into my veins like oh god yeah, there's a one shot where they're like, it's night. They're wearing the satin jackets and like Miami's in the background. And you're like, ah, my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So good. Nice. Uh, yeah. And also, it, it was great to watch a music documentary where like people aren't malcontents per se. Like they're brothers. So they fight and they have, you know, these issues or whatever. But mm -hmm. uh, it's not like, Oh, well, one person is obviously a raging dickhead and they had to break up because of it. Or like, you know, they all are, are kind of honest about, oh, uh, uh, I wanted to be a solo artist and he wanted to be a solo artist. So we tried to be solo artists and it sucked. So we got back together. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, uh, you know, instead of, uh, you know, the usual ego tiptoeing. Yeah. 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 Um, it was over the, over the weekend. I uh 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 a very a, 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 a sort of similar story, much shorter, I'm sure. I uh went and looked at the the history of tattoo. You remember tattoo? T A T U, the Russian. Oh, all the things you said, all the things yeah. you said, run up through my head. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it very interesting because I um uh, you know I knew that there was like questions after the fact of like, well, how, what was the reality of their lifestyle compared yeah. to what, what was presented? I didn't realize that but apparently they just like had a huge blow up and like, like the two things with those two girls was they had a huge blow up and they, uh, every time they got back together, they definitely just made things worse. 
and we're notorious for canceling live shows because they never sold enough or there were always like problems with the shows, something like that. Um, I always got the sense with them that they were a manufactured group from Russia and anything that we know about manufactured groups in America uh, or like where it's, it's even more of a, a cultural phenomenon, like in, in the Asian countries um, mm-hmm. like that. It has to be just that, but plus Russia and the underworld and, and, and then just the elements of Russia that go into it where it's like, you know, we have enough, I mean, when you look at the people who put together manufactured groups in America, yeah, yeah. it's dicey. <laughs> I can't imagine when it's just some Ooh. Russian oligarch's nephew or whatever that's just like, no, you two, you will kiss now. You, will, I put a band together. Did uh, did you ever see the Boy Band Con uh, documentary about Lou Pearlman? No. Um, God. That was, I think it's still on YouTube it was like a YouTube premium or original doc or something, but like Lance Bass put it together and it's oh, really, yeah. And it's, and it's all about, uh, you know, uh, how, how, how grody, how grody do we get with Lou Pearlman? Uh, it's been a while since I've seen it, but I remember there, there are a couple of interviews that they, that, uh, talk about, some grodiness. I yeah, say. I cuz I feel like there's you have to make a decision about whether or not that documentary is about the music or if it's about like that, you know, the, a, 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 mm-hmm. a Epstein level like, <laughs> you know, a horrifying stuff. No, I think it's uh it it really kind of puts those elements of Perlman's life as a as a also ran part of the story only because you have a couple of of people he produced saying like, yeah, he like did X, Y, and Z, and then you have uh, strung out Aaron Carter. Was it Aaron Carter who's in this in this documentary? You have like strung out mm-hmm. Aaron Carter who's like, I would I would die for Lou Pearlman. He never did blah, 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 blah in front of me, and so I I think they kind of just say, here are some here are some words. Have had it. Have what you he, want, and then they t- had because his- I think the rest of the story is also like really interesting in terms of just yeah. like yeah, I don't know. We went and found whoever worked at Disney and Universal and said, "Hey, you want to make music? You want to you want to sing some songs?" There was this property in downtown Orlando that he owned and developed, and kind of the joke in the '90s was sort of we'd be we'd, we'd go through there, be like, "Quick guys, move fast." <laughs> 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 get through yeah. here fast as you can because at the, the upstairs claw. levels were his offices and stuff you're like ah, hey boys what if you in a band <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh my god um, yeah um but that but i that i i like that i thought that that was a good doc in terms of at least just you know talking about you know like all of the bad deals that those kids and their families ended up being oh, sucked God. into and yeah. the manufactured rivalries between all of the different bands and X, you know, Y, and Z. I finally saw the HBO doc um, Class Action Park about Action Park. Did you guys see that? Mm-mm. I didn't. I think um, Brian had seen it. So that's another one that has a hard time really squaring what they want the documentary to be about. Mm. And it kind of like is it's worth seeing, but it, it has these very three kind of disparate threads that they're never fully able to tie together. Like one is a story about the guy that made class action park, who is or action park, who's a character and a a product of eighties wall street, uh, who also was like this, like, Lord of the Flies, Walt Disney, who's just like the best thing that we can give to kids is an unsupervised, uh, uh, an unsupervised theme park where you control how fast you go and how high you jump off and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then there's what it became culturally. And especially for b- kids from Jersey, it was this like rite of passage. And sometimes your friends got hurt and sometimes, you know, they didn't, but everybody knew somebody who did. And, and it was kind of lawless and and there was like a very like testosterone machismo sort of element to it 
And then there's the fact that people died there. Ew. And yeah. and they never really know because you can't dial any of those up too high. You can't make him the the main guy seem like too wacky of a character because there was actual consequences. You can't say you can't just have it all be a bunch of people going like, "Yeah, man, it was so dangerous and crazy." Action park, right? Like, and then you can't also, unless you're just gonna make it a, this very sad story, focus totally on 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 the deaths. And I think that that's as we're in this documentary boom that we're seeing, where everything gets some form of documentation, be it a blog post, a podcast, or a, or or a filmed documentary. Um, you know, that's that's always the problem. Is like some that documentary was not fully cracked like you had to figure out you had to focus on one of them and understand where you wove the undernotes of the other ones in mm, okay uh justin did you need to take a break no let's go okay uh yeah so for after things we got that email i forwarded you that email mm -hmm. andrew but i think that's pretty good and then um uh uh, I I I would like just a set of ears on on the new project I'm working on, but that's not any sort of rush if we go long on this email. We'll think about it, Bryce. <laughs> okay. Of course, of course, Bryce. Uh, Alrighty. Well, uh, you guys ready to start then? Ready, ready, ready. All right. I'm gonna count you in, <clears throat> Andrew. In three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. Wrong, Andrew. Wrong. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll do it again. We'll do it again. Going in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Mr. Bryce, the legend, Castillo. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> the legend. <laughs> Hey, so uh, we got a letter from uh, one of our favorite longtime friends here, which is Selena, a.k.a. Ilink, mm -hmm. and she writes, hi, A.T. That's after things. That's us. Yeah, I um, like to be short for A-team, but that's fine. <laughs> could be, could be. Got some questions about building an audience on Patreon and Twitch and was wondering if any of you can chime in on this. I recently funded a book of illustrations on Kickstarter with 175 backers. Great. I followed the rules of Kickstarter, which is to not use any of the backers' emails for marketing purposes outside the campaign. On my last Kickstarter update, I invited backers to join an email list I created that will send out a monthly newsletter updating them on my current art project. I only got a handful of signups, so I'm wondering what to do about building an audience for my current project. I will use Kickstarter the future to fund this project and want to make sure I'm building towards that since the next campaign will have a higher funding goal. The idea is to then use these two self-published projects as credibility when pitching future projects to publishers. I have a Patreon, but it's only had a few dozen patrons at most over the last few years. I have a Twitch account and am considering creating an art stream where I digitally paint each of the illustrations for my upcoming book. What can I do outside of this to get word out? Does being on Reddit help? Do I do the awful thing of TikToking? <laughs> Art Thuggin, Selena. Man, that's that's interesting because nobody's more likely to buy your next thing than people who bought your previous thing. And if you're worried about Kickstarter getting annoyed of, about you reaching out, um, then one thing uh, what I would do is if 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 you suspect that that let's say 200 people on Kickstarter are the most likely to want to follow your next thing, then continue to reach out to them about the thing they did, but also continue to remind them that that there's an off-ramp to the next project that you would really appreciate if they would get on. And also, like, you know, some of the Kickstarter campaigns that I have funded just don't want to stop just don't emailing you <laughs> yeah. all the time. And maybe, maybe it's a very specific thing of like, well, you can't take the emails out of Kickstarter and plug them into MailChimp or something. But I get messages for stuff that I've backed years ago. And, and I'm, I, I think they do it because to some amount of, to some factor it works. Um, so I bet you get at least a couple of swings at that. Um, certainly of saying, Hey, thank you for subscribing to the thing or thank you for pledging. Here's the next thing. Really uh, give it a look. Um, without being too I've, annoying too many times. I've fallen for a thing a couple times, and I think I'm okay with it, where I back a campaign, and I get, hey, we need you to click this link in order to, you know, to, to, sat, you know, to, to figure out your order details, whatever. 
and I click on the link and it's not Kickstarter. They take me to some third party company that's got a Kickstarter service. And like, oh, we want to, you know, get your opinion on this or blankety blank, and then also opt into our email, click submit. And that's kind of how they do it. And it's kind of clever because the idea is like, oh, I got to do this to fulfill my order. I'm like, oh, it's not really to fulfill my order. This is just they're using a service that maybe helps them fulfill it, but they want to make sure they got my email outside of Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. You could do a thing like, hey, uh, by the way, if you haven't checked out her project, it's the Illust the Illuminated Tweets of Elon Musk, which was fantastic, an amazingly well done book, beautiful coloring style book with all these illustrations that are great consider saying thanks to everybody. I have a bonus thing. Just click over here to get a bonus poster or something people can print out like a PDF or whatever. Hmm. Um, give people bonus content. Just say, just, you know, can you, you know, let me use your email to let, you know, let me keep you in touch with what else is coming out. Feel free to follow up again. Just offer another piece of content. I know it's just easy to say, just make another thanks, make another brilliant piece of work and just offer it. But, um, so the way that we handled it with um, between contender and action news was, I mean, I think we were using the same account. So there's effectively like there are elements where the next time that you are going to, going to do a Kickstarter uh, you can strategically pump out messages for the next Kickstarter from the old one. And that technically does not, uh, violate Kickstarter's TOS per se. Um, so if you, you know, do the pre, the launch, the middle lull, and then that final 48 hours or whatever, like the, the, the strategic places where you want to goose a Kickstarter, then you can just send out mass blasts from there. Beyond that, and this is just between the everybody here, especially if it's 175 emails. Just export them to a mailing list. I'm whispering. Or, or <laughs> yeah, I mean, or just copy and paste them one at a time and write them a personal email from your personal email account saying, yeah. hey, right. it's me, that person that you supported, just writing you one to one. This is not a form, you know, yes, it's a form letter, but no, I'm individually s sending each one. Um, or, or, or send people, uh, man, do people love gifts? You're like, I drew your name and it's like, nope, it really is. I just wrote the word Brian and I put flowers around it. Um, uh, or uh, if you, it'd if be you, great if you could join my sanitized email list or even as like, Hey, you know, I'm working on a new Kickstarter thing. I can throw a postcard or a little thank you note into the next thing. If you email me back or any number of things as a way to, to, kind of reacquire those those emailers and really get back on their radar because I, I think that's what she's really looking for is is a way to keep keep this conversation going in a uh, uh, a fair uh, so in a way that feels fair right or or give give people a choice say uh, hey we're at the end or we're nearing the end never be at the end always be nearing the end of our journey together please select one of the two yes I want to follow you on your next journey no, never contact me again. And then, uh, you know, anybody who doesn't respond, assume that, you know, what they're really saying is ask me again later. <laughs> and then I, and I, I mean, that all seems inbounds, but, but, but I agree at the numbers that we're talking about and from the behavior that we've seen on Kickstarter, I don't know, as, as long as you're talking ostensibly about the Kickstarter that they signed up for, yeah. it's all inbounds. Or your next project. I mean, people, you know, those campaigns that spam you are often like, in a big sharing circle and like, you know, oh, well, you know, we'll promote your Kickstarter to our list if you pay. And blah, 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 blah. Like, this is you saying, I'm doing another thing. You, you know, supported me before. I there's a very clear, uh, you know, if, if, if feeling good is a, is a part of this, I think it's very easy to feel good about using any of the, those so, tools. So outside of the Kickstarter ecosystem, let's offer some suggestions for growth. I would say that the, the advantage you have, Selena, is that you have art that's really cool. And I don't know how much you're sharing now or putting out there, but making things that are very retweetable and, you know, she did a lot of fun stuff with the Elon Musk things. I think the more stuff that you put out into your Twitter feed that people can retweet that's embedded and easy for people to follow and make it very easy to capture people, like we should probably take a look and see on your Twitter, like how easy is it for somebody to follow you and to, to kind of build that. And so, you know, Jack, 
Goldfinger, uh, director of Magic Entertainment at Entertainment at Magic Castle, is an incredible former and a super nice guy, and he's full of all sorts of wisdoms. And sometimes you sound he sounds kind of like he's a little bit crazy because that's Jack. But one of his sayings is "success leaves clues," and you know you can look at it in a lot of ways. But one of the things is that one how people are successful there are clues to succeed how they did it. The other thing is that people who succeed. The evidence is out there. If you're a person who's making art and making things, it's in front of people. I've had people ask me, like, I had a conversation with a friend the other day, like, well, you know, you were lucky because you got into TV because of magic, and that's how you got your book deals and stuff. I'm like, they're unrelated. Like, I got my oh, book yeah. deals because I just wrote a bunch of books. You know, I got into TV because I just, I figured out, don't go to networks, go to every, call every single production company you can, and eventually, and it's like, it's the same thing as people think, oh, I just, I put a thing into the world. What more am I supposed to do? You know, it's like yeah. they, they they are related insofar as the same engine that causes you to be a successful touring performer tends to be the same engine that causes you to be a successful author. And and certainly it doesn't hurt um uh when when somebody is betting on you to succeed in one field, if they've seen you succeed literally anywhere else, then that that they, certainly the, doesn't hurt. The funny thing though was like a and E had no idea that I wrote novels, right. and my publishers had no idea I was involved in TV. It yes. was like the things, the two big things that happened in my life. Yeah, I'm the same person, but the idea it wasn't like I didn't get a book deal because I had a TV show. Some well, people are like oh. exactly, like, no. and yeah. and to be honest, if you tried to sell a book deal based on the fact that you have a TV show, I think it would actually reduce your chances for success. Is, is, I mean, that there's a reason that that I'm such a fan of individually siloing projects because. Uh, it gives you a, a clue as to success leaves clue. It gives you a clue as to whether or not this one's destined for success or not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, 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 I think for art, the way that I've seen art work is it's usually Instagram based. You got to get your hashtag game going there. You got to be regular. You got to be a, a, a constant presence in people's lives. And if you fill a niche, then that helps. Uh, but that Twitter, um, you know, there, it's actually not a dissimilar rhythm to what we do. Uh, but it's a little bit more direct where it's just like free, 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 a big project. I want you to support like that. That is the, the pattern is every once in a while when you have a relationship with people that you have already given them so much. You have a project that you think is worth it, that you need money to to support. They will follow you there on on social media. But I would say use the social media channels that you have to continue to build that. And then look, uh, nothing moves money like Kickstarter. Contact people based on old projects that you have a new project. Uh, uh, they are nine times out of ten very happy that they get to support you again. So your her, Selena's next project um, is, and by the way, so I would say on your Twitter, if you want to put like click here to sign up for my email, your website, I would say put more you in there because it sounds like it's kind of like a company, which I know we kind of want to do, but also, we, we like to follow people. And so I'd put more of you into there. Your next project sounds amazing, which is a space colonization themed tarot deck. Which like and there are so many all of those keywords are really buzzy. They're like really uh, any one of those things would fit, you know, exactly well on an Instagram ad or post. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I would say the more of that you want to share, like it, it, the thing that's kind of the secret is, is give away more than you think you should be giving away because you're going to get back away more. When I started writing books, we gave the books away for free and it paid back way more than I thought I could. You know, Brian did, taught magic for free you know and it just yielded so much more so you've got this wonderful art the more of it you feel comfortable sharing to people and putting up there and like the space theme tarot that just sounds sounds amazing i already want to order it um <laughs> just keep sharing and get people get people you want people to, what are you you're an artist share your art you're a lot of things but share the art put that out there yeah and yes. and you know you, you, you she kind of mentions tiktok and like you know, I and a non there has been a non-zero number of people I have followed off of TikTok because of their TikToks. And 
like the one I can think of, I mentioned this in the Night Attack pre-show, I think last week, but there's a, com- there's a competitive eater. There's like a challenge eater lady. And I found her because she does TikToks of her e- doing the challenges. And so on TikTok, it's just like, she speeds it up. So you pretty much see her do the whole thing in 60 seconds, which is very different from her videos. But that made me go and check out her videos. And, um, you know, that's a, that's a very specific example of, of reformatting what you're doing to fit on social media and to fit for discoverability. I think it would be very cool to see, you know, a time lapse of, of you doing, you know, of you, of you designing stuff or, uh, you know, but people do like stages. Here's, here's a, you know, sketching and then inking and then coloring all, all these other things. Like, I think there's a way to take your development process, your, your actual creating process and turn that into social media content or, you know, a, a promotional tool in a similar way. So uh, we have somebody else who's working on a project. <laughs> Justin, care to tell us what Bryce is working on? <laughs> Wait, what is Bryce working on? <laughs> uh, oh, glad you asked, Bryce. Yeah. Uh, so over over the, the Christmas break, I was doing uh, daily streams here on our Night Attack Twitch channel. So every so often I've been doing these uh, uh, streams called Marbles with Bryce, and there's a video game where you run it on the on on stream and people end up enter a command in chat and they get a little marble with their name on it in the game and it's like a race it's like those marble race videos and uh it's all simulated so no one has any control but it's a fun kind of physics thing and there's a lot of engagement i we just got our twitch uh uh recap for the year of like our stats and stuff our most used emote for the year was the emote that we spam at the end of those races more than like our night attack diamond emotes or anything and so uh, you that's know, great it's been fun and and part of uh my uh part of uh i i like doing it it's a lot of fun it's not very difficult but i have a hard time finding a regular time to do it right um you know the best sort of thing you can do when you're doing something uh, uh that is you know multiple parts or or continuous is to have a strong schedule or have regularity and I haven't been able to have any of that and so doing you know these nine days over the holidays uh showed me that it was it was able to be done and that it would not be boring if you did an hour of it every day even um and so um my plan is to start doing weekly these weekly streams beginning in February and I've been putting a lot of work into finding ways that I can build stuff on top of the game because right now it's just a game right it's just a game that this company makes and they keep track of points and they run their own seasonal stuff and you can buy skins and stuff from them and 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 whatnot um but i've been trying to come up with ways to make it a very engaging experience and um uh make it something that uh you can only really get from watching it happen here on this channel you know, there are a lot of people you, who. Could you show us video of this? Just, just so I have content. I'm sorry. Sure. No, that. absolutely. So, um, you know, uh, 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 sorry. Other, uh, other people who stream this game, right? Like, it's, it's a very low, uh, the, like the lowest common denominator for this game is like, you run the game and you click go. You know, every couple of minutes when it's time, and you can just do that, and you can just sit back and. Um, you could do that for hours and the thing that i've i've enjoyed about doing it um uh here on the chat is being able to make it a very engaging experience and and you know calling it like a uh, like a race or like a like a sporting event and um and i i think that's something that you really don't see a lot with the other people who stream this game is they'll just sit back and they're just talking to the chat and they're drinking a beer and Oh, time to start the next thing. And so I, that, I, that's something I really don't see anybody else doing with this thing. And, and so um, that's what I'm trying to build on top of. I, I, so I'm wrapping my head around this. So this is powered by chat, like people putting their names and stuff in there? Uh, in order to participate, you have to be in chat. And you just, uh, you just say, yes, I want to participate by using right. an emote. And then, uh, and then, and then, and then it's, it's all just, simulated. It's just a pachinko game after, after right, that. Right, 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 yeah. right. No, yeah. I get it. That's a ma- uh, such a clever concept. 
And like, oh, yeah. oh my god. A lot of our friends, we've turned a lot of our friends onto this game and and like Lobro, I think Lobro now has a little icon in the game you can buy because he does it so Oh, often. that's great. Um, you could do this concept of like chat powered gaming because you could do like massive combat stuff with just like mm-hmm. type it in keys and have people go to war with each other and, and all sorts of stuff. Well, oh, that yeah, that, that stuff there's in the a game. Whole, that stuff in yeah. they've got a battle royale mode and everyone gets let loose into a thing and you can target people like it is a that is a whole thing that they've built oh, on so amazing and so for for me what i'm trying to do is add another layer on top of it so that what is happening and what you're watching um is unique to to this channel and unique to the stream right and so like i've spent the past like two or three weeks building learning uh air table and databases and building our own stat thing so we can track our own uh you know point totals and 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 stats and make it visible on the web so everybody can kind of see where they're standing in kind of our own league of of the game um and uh you know i'm building out video bumpers and i'm figuring out uh, oh we can do highlights for you know the last week's game and this and that and the other thing and the thing that i'm starting to think about now because i'm i'm about two or three weeks away from starting the weekly the weekly streams and really putting it in is starting to think about what is the long term um Mm. goal for it because right now it's a fun hobby it's not very expensive the database thing i'm using is not really meant to be back-end database but it'll work well enough for this thing and it's cheap uh you know i already have the adobe stuff i already do streaming a lot um it's you know twitch is, is obviously free the game is is free to play um but I'm trying to think about like what is the what what are the next steps and and what are some of the pitfalls right like like the second that this game goes down or everyone decides that they don't like it this this whole thing like goes up in smoke so like that's what a do big you like order. about it I like what do, a, what do you like that what I like about it is hosting it and 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 really having a very fun tight you know action kind of thing it is a it is a sport it is a, a live sporting event. And um, it is it is so fun engaging with everyone in the chat and and finding, oh, you know, you you got a record and uh oh, people are getting, you know, deleted off of the track and whatnot. Like, I like it as that kind of exciting experience. Um, And I think that that's something that not a lot of people. uh, Let me let me rephrase the question. Sure. What do you want? I. Yeah. What do you want? (laughs) What do you want? I mean. Uh, that I guess that's a that's I, I think uh, was, we have a clue in the mere fact that you don't have an answer like I mean uh, I because, like doing because, it. I, I, well correct yeah. correct but but you didn't immediately blurt out I want it to be the number one stream on Twitch you didn't blurt out I want to do it five days a week or or wait, 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 uh, wait, wait. I, I well, want about, a thousand people in a single game I want like, I ask people sometimes that too Brian and they they want to say that but they're afraid to say that because they don't want to be accused of being egotistical why so are you afraid Bryce why are you afraid <laughs> stop being afraid <laughs> and, and, man up you, and, why won't and you, you admit that success leaves clues <laughs> well and you know you know Brian you know very well that I try to be very modest in in terms of keeping yeah this ain't the place for that <laughs> you know like i i would like it to be something that that could support itself it would be really awesome if it was a thing where money could come in to support the different back end parts of it uh if if it was something that could support doing it multiple times a week right like this first schedule that i've got set out is about 10 weeks long or so but it would be great to do something longer or or um have a lot of people really interested i'd like it to be something where it's not just people logging onto twitch to watch this game and play this game but you know really tune in and watch the thing that i'm doing here which is you know a kind of appointment thing it, it it sounds like what you really what you want is a growing community that supports your version of this process of this game um and if that's the case uh not only in terms of financial growth but also in terms of of making a space for it like i would say you got to treat it like a community that's there to grow i would get a separate discord for it i would get um I, i would create separate social stuff for it and and i would say like look 
we're all here. Uh, obviously, it's going to branch out of Diamond Club and Night Attack and everything that's there. But if you want it to be something special, if you want it to be something uh, uh, apart, then you got to give it room to grow there. And, and you got to uh, feed the most hardcore people that want to do it. The most hardcore people that are always there. What, what do they want to mod? How would they want to change it? What kind, how does that affect your presentation? How does that affect the rules of, of, of the game? Do you do special variants on certain nights? Like mm -hmm. uh, these are all paths down the road that you can take as you have an engaged audience that wants uh, uh, more of what you're selling. The, uh, the first impulse I have is uh, break it apart from, it, it sounds to me like your favorite part is the part you can control. Uh, and so what you want to do is you want to break apart the brand from anything you can't control. If you say the word marbles in it, what happens when nobody likes marbles anymore? Uh, so that tells me you'd probably want to call it Friday Night Bryce, but, and this may be hard to wrap your mind around, what happens when even Bryce doesn't want to do it anymore? And sure. so, uh, uh, you know, f figure out something scalable where, uh, again, there's the thing you you claim to be doing, and then there's what you're really doing. And and what you're claiming to be doing is playing marbles. What you're really doing is is giving everyone a chance for one brief moment. Everybody on that stream has a chance to be the world champion at something, whatever that is. And you can mm -hmm. accelerate the uh, the stakes of it by reaching out to real sponsors, getting real prizes. Uh, you'll have to deal with fulfillment and all that stuff. But then all of a sudden, it's like you know every every X night. You give away over a thousand dollars in prizes donated from twenty five different people to the top twenty five people. Everyone get in. Uh, I mean, that's that's how. Uh, what was it? HQ was uh, people. Uh, people get real addicted to the possibility that that maybe this will be their day. And and if you're good in your sports casting, which of course you are, we know this. Um, then then they'll stick around and they'll keep even when the MacGuffin changes from marbles to a different game, or even to a real life plinko board that you built, or or you know watching uh, uh, two dogs on a grid figuring out whether they're going to poop on a red square or a blue square or, or whatever. Like uh, at some point, the MacGuffin doesn't matter. People are there for stakes and the joy and the ritual. And so what you want to do is make sure. That, that you have complete control of as many aspects of that as you can and that they can scale with or without you. Mm -hmm. the, my, oh no, please, Andrew. But my vote for name is Bryce FL. Um, <laughs> and, and I think following the idea of like, you are like, look at this, like, Blazeball amazes me because it only came out in July. Mm -hmm. It only came out in July and it feels like something's been around forever because it just struck a nerve and people like this and it's fun to talk about and stuff. And I would just say for you is like what Brian double down on Brian, the community, create a name and I put your name in it, whatever, it doesn't matter, but create it's fun with you, fun with the community and, but create like your fake league. Are you like a freak, like your own, like yeah. FL or whatever? Cause I think that yeah. would be cool because and I, branding becomes so easy. Uh, I actually do have, I did come up with uh, the, the name that I came up with is, um, uh, open league marbles. And that's very specific because there are, there's another, there's a very popular YouTube channel that does physical marbles events and races and stuff. And to the tune of millions of viewers. And, uh, uh, I, I want it to be clear that it's different. It's not the name of this other thing, which, what is, is the name of the other thing? Uh, Yelly's marbles league, I think is what it's called yeah. or marble I, your marbles race. I, and so I, I, uh, so I, I don't know that my thinking with calling it open league marbles is that you are playing and it's open to people, people to play. Um, but what about okay. when there's another chat based thing that's different than marbles and really cool? Yeah. I mean, we can make, you want to make more that. new names, right? Like wh whatever. That's, are that's the name of the Thursday thing. And then I, 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 I here, I, I think this is where we start to get into a thing where like Bryce knows his community and Bryce is going to figure out where, 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 where that tuning fork kind of resonates with them. But, but the naming thing I think is, is important. And my instinct as I think is for Andrew, uh, you can never go wrong with something, a, just a touch more broad mm -hmm. that then will always be like dash marble. Well, you, you can also have the best race. of both worlds. Uh, let's say, you know, you can spell open league a little bit creatively 
and uh, have a colon in there. So it's Open League colon marbles. And then sure. five months from now, when, when darts is the thing, it's Open League darts or whatever it is. And it's like all of a sudden Open League as one word with three E's becomes the thing that people associate with. Oh, that's that thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I that. That that seems like a very doable thing. Like, um, uh, I, I, cause I don't, I, I, I would like it to not be a name that isn't, I want it to, when I, I want to say the word marbles when I'm doing the marbles thing. So I'm not like, well, it's, this is, you know, uh, the, the, the Bryce FL and, well, what is that? Well, it's the part of the marbles thing. Well, why don't you just call it a marbles thing? Well, no, uh, well, that's fine. Know. Have the word marbles in there, but but have have the other part of it that could be broken out so you could swap out another word. Sure. Um, uh, the, one of the other things I'm I'm thinking about is like, okay, well, where? What about you know, if if one of the things I'd like to do later down the line is eventually figure out a way for people to support it, is um, how do I do that in such a way that creates very low friction to the user, right? No, part, part, number one, tip, tip, tip jar now. Tip sure. jar now. Yeah, like, they, we've like, got one on the Here's channel. my Venmo. Here's my, my PayPal. Figure out some element, some like moment where it's like, and now the MVP brought to you by my Venmo. Everybody go to my Venmo right now. <laughs> like figure out ways there, there, there are, there are forms and functions in the, the concept of sports that already lend themselves to advertising. Make sure that you figure out a way that that is benefiting you. But in general, and look, this goes to the naming and everything else. Yes, we could figure out how to perfectly plan out your next 20 years and it'll go over five different games that we'll invent in our head and we'll think about ways that you can be flexible. But guess what? None of that'll matter unless everybody's having the most possible fun with marbles right now. So whatever is jazzing your community the most right mm -hmm. now, that's the thing to do. What do they like? Like what, what do they want that they don't even know to tell you that they are obviously screaming as a group uh, uh, just go offer things, try things, sure. make, make mm -hmm. them, the, the 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 center and uh, you know the 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 money you know the money will kind of figure itself out i've i've found in in terms of like either it's a patreon or it's it's donations or it's uh, uh other stuff but like if you create the culture and you honor the culture and you reward people who are showing up all the time not only with a good product but also with the ability for them to build part of their identity around it, uh, and and to you, that's that's it. That's gold. That's you, you know secret sauce. Uh, talking about community, you know, I I m m for the past few years, pretty much almost everything I've streamed, video games wise, or or even this, has been on the Night Attack Twitch channel, and you know we've it's. I I I feel some trepidation of trying to split out and you know new Discord server and at what point does this does this does this leave the Night Attack channel or or you know all that stuff and and you know I uh I don't know I I I just have certain trepidations about it because I think there's al I mean, there's already a lot of fracturing like like it, honestly speaking I think there's a lot of fracturing that's happened in the past few years with the Diamond Club community of people just you know they've got their own podcast so they go and they make a server and now all those people yeah. live on their server um which is uh, you know I guess the design of it but because especially because this is so tied into you know the night attack twitch stuff and and uh, uh, uh I don't know my positioning I I I don't know I just feel th this is a part where I feel weird about making that specific move no well number number one use the channel as as a platform because it's just empty bandwidth and people know you here. Right. Uh, I would say that the, the discord is literally just because you want a place where if somebody's watching you and they know you for that, they've got a place where they're just talking marbles, you know? Hmm. Uh, uh, and it's not, you know, somebody's going to talk about, you know, my, my, my dead father coming back to life five years ago. Right. Like, uh, uh, they, just a place where people can just talk about uh, this thing, 
right? Mm -hmm. Like the niche. Like the Diamond Club is always going to be a catch-all. The Night Attack is always going to be a catch-all, and we're we're thrilled that we can be a a, a catch-all. But for growth beyond the community, you've got to plant a flag somewhere. Now, does that eventually mean that you start your own channel and now you can use Twitch as a, 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 a more effective monetization strategy? Maybe. But but that'll be when you want to, uh, uh, when you want to decide that you want to trade off that install base for the bits and 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 stuff like that that you can do going forward. And maybe that that doesn't happen all at the same time. Maybe you do Fridays are always on Night Attack, and then you do the special stream on on your new thing, and you just you know until that gets built up then then you don't do a full transition uh you can you can stay for as long as you want we're not going to turn your room into an office you're always welcome and i'll do your laundry but it is uh it's never gonna it's never uh it's always going to be seductive to be where you know you can always reach a certain number of people it was not fun to go back to zero subscribers on the modern road channel uh but mm -hmm. here we are four years later with a bunch of people who are non-ironically saying i just found out brian does magic you know and it's like yeah. what how yeah. can you even you know, yeah yeah <laughs> i i yeah you know and i i think i recognize that you know whatever success is that is eventually down you know a, a, a step to take um uh but i guess i'm trying to think of other conceptual pitfalls that might be and i think i think we did uh, you know, highlight a few things, but, um, just, you know, it's, I, I've, I've had my head buried deep in, into these table, table bases for two weeks and it's been a lot of fun, uh, just learning, uh, a faux SQL. Uh, but, uh, I, I don't want to start doing it and have everyone say, why are you doing this? Can we just play the game? Why are we watching highlight videos or why are you doing your own stats or this or that or the other thing and so i'm just trying off to, my stream <laughs> I, i'm just trying to figure out what 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 pitfalls i should be uh, aware of so that i'm i am focusing on making the experience fun i mean that's the whole point of it right is is that i think i give the best version of this out there and how do i how do i not just say i did a lot of work everybody aren't you happy i did a lot of work uh, well here's here's what you want here's a pitfall um mm. Prepare yourself for the possibility of massive overnight success and decide would, if it would, if everything you're doing right now, mm -hmm. if everything 100x tomorrow and then 100x the day after that, think of the serious problems you would have mm -hmm. that, that, that would, that, uh, if your solution involves, and I hope we're not too successful as any part of it, then it's not a solution. Okay. Yeah. I think, uh, and I think most things that I've, I'm building up on top of of this experience, it's not a problem. Like the database thing, I think is because it's not really supposed to be used for that. It's really just advanced project management software um, that just happens to be a database thing. Um, but I think I think a lot of the other stuff has been like is creative stuff and and stuff off stream, preparing stuff ahead of time, and most of that stuff won't even scale I mean, if there are ten thousand. Right, that's people. that's the Google question: is does it scale, and does does your whole system scale? And I think, and if it doesn't scale, then then change things so that it can scale. Yeah, and and I think most everything can like the other than the database thing, which would just be moving to another database. There's I don't know if 2021 can you make a database? Yes. Um. Uh. And then like the actual game itself, right? Like there, are, I'm sure limits to how many people can play the game. But there are also people who are 10 times bigger than me who play this game, and they managed to make it work. So. I, I think you're focused. Everything you mentioned I, so far has been technical things. I think sure. we're talking about storytelling things in terms of the name, yeah. the title. Is okay. there? Are you capturing emails? Are you? Uh, have you thought about what the discussion looks like when Justin and Brian are like, dude, every time we go happy hour, people berate us because we're not playing marbles. What's going on? Like, I, that's, mm -hmm. that's the stuff that you need to think through. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also, here's the biggest thing you need to think through. Building a community is like being a DJ. You are playing music and some songs people are kind of into, some songs people go wild for. The only thing you can do is keep playing songs and realize why they like the ones that they're crazy for and why they're not into the ones that they're not. 
play more of the shit they like, play less of the stuff they don't, and keep going forward, keep everybody as engaged as possible. And and again, identity. Identity. What does it mean to be a marbles person? What time are you meeting? How long do you stay there? Like, give them the gift of that. You yeah. are creating this world. Like, like you need to give it a, 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 a name and a place so they know what to call themselves. Yeah. And, and that is a big part of it. Like, like I mentioned, like when, when I drop the, you know, when I actually announce this thing, like I'm going to have a schedule and it's going to have days and times and it's going to say like, it's, it's that, that is, that is a big part of it because, you know, that's been something that's been holding it back to a certain degree is just, I've been doing it whenever I can do it and whenever I feel like I'm able to do it. And so having a schedule and having a certain amount of regularity is one of the big points of let's do it more. Let's do it on, you know, a night when everyone knows it's going to be happening. Um, and all of the other stuff just feels like gravy at this point. Like this, a lot of it is just like, just need to see that this thing works, uh, you know, a dry I mean, run to, to some degree. Honestly, for that, for the project that you're talking about, this is far more about being a bunch of people being together on the internet. Like, because it is pachinko, right? Mm -hmm. It is, uh, 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 you know, just a, a kind of, very elaborate random number generator that can be slightly influenced. But at the end of the day, we all get to hang out. So it's like, congratulations. You know that going in, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's it, 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 like, like, so now, now that you know, this is a community, where do you put the lawn chairs? Do you install a bar? Like uh, how, how long are the hours? The, the more, the better, the less, the better. Where, where, where do you go? Like, like that's that, those are all the big questions. But part of it is also, again, start by giving them a place to hang out 24 seven. That is just dedicated to them because that's, nobody wants to be like, I'm in a community. I derive part of my identity. You want to know what? All day, all week, man. I was thinking about marbles on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And on Friday, I got to hang out with all my best friends again. Where can I meet them? Oh, on the 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 the, the forty something and and thirty something guys comedy server. Mm -hmm. Like no, like they want their server. They want their community, right? Like like they want to always hang out and talk about the mods they're gonna do. They want to talk about other streams that are similar to this. They they want to hang out and talk about Wandavision <laughs> and 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 everything else that's going on because this is their community. They get to hang out and talk to each other all this time. Okay. No, I think I think that's very helpful. Um, I I think I think this has been a very helpful conversation. Uh, in terms Good. Of, of figuring a lot of that stuff out. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Cool. Awesome. I'm still like I I <laughs> had this conversation. Game. I just had this conversation with my girlfriend last night. Like you sometimes don't. People say we we can, there are things we think we need. We need a better this. We need a better this. And then sometimes things come at us that we'd never even thought of, or you know, weren't in the zeitgeist, you're like, holy cow, this is amazing. And, and those are rare, but those are really special. And like, you could see like, oh, people, a lot of people like to watch people play games. A lot of people like to chat and message boards on Twitch. What if you tied that message board into a real time game? Things happened and it would be like, why not just go play like World of Warcraft or, you know, you know, uh, Fortnite or something like, no, it's different. And I could see the argument of like, why you wouldn't people, nobody would want to do that. But then you're like, you already have a platform. There's already people, there's already a chat thing and people want to press a button there to interact with the thing on their TV, which we call a computer. And it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. It's just brilliant. The fact that and I think that I was like, kind of saying, get away from the marbles name. Cause like, I'm ready to start a company right now that just builds <laughs> games on top of this concept of like, people typing things into the chat room affect, you know, the monkey presses a button in home mm -hmm. and all of a sudden something happens on the screen with everybody else. Yeah. Is and there are huge. Yeah, there, there are, are lots of games that like um, uh, when Twitch played all of Pokemon uh, where, where it's like uh, just to even move, everyone had to hit left, 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 left to counteract oh, sure. the people who were saying right, right, right. And essentially mm -hmm. a consensus uh, developed. Yeah. There've been, yeah, there've been like, crowd like mess things before to be sure but like at this point the way that idea that like it's a repeat and the beyond a novelty kind of thing that idea that you could go in there and 
the simplification of the game first like it's you're a marble watch your marble fall to the bottom but then that's that's really something special i don't know i'm just still in awe (laughs) awesome i Uh, I like it when i'm just these things happen so it's fun join i guess we'll have to join the new server (laughs) <laughs> oh, I'll never play it. I'll never play it. But you just gotta. T- it's 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 so easy. You gotta play to win. It's not... uh, then it's then I get addicted. It's not good. It's not good price. Uh, gentlemen, want to do picks? Uh, yes, I have a totally original pick that nobody has ever said before. It's completely my idea. You're welcome because I'm the first to tell you about a little thing called the Oculus Quest Two. Uh, uh, it it's pretty great. Nice. What what game did you get for it? Um, boy, that is the hard part. After after using my Vive for so long, going back and paying thirty dollars again and again for a bunch of games I already own, mm-hmm. that ain't fun. Uh, but uh, but mainly, I intend to uh, start every day uh, taking meetings on the links, like all successful businessmen, playing a little bit of uh, what is it? Walkabout golf. Walkabout uh, m- mini golf. Miniature oh. golf. It's great. That's uh, it does a. It's astonishing how emotive just a floating head and a putter can be. Ah, nice. Yeah, I would like to play with another co-host, but they haven't accepted my friend request on Ooh. Oculus. Ooh, who could that be? Place your bets I, I now, everybody. It. <laughs> it's me. I didn't see it. I'll invite hey, uh, I don't know if you see the background there. Anchor, the battery company, they have a charger for the Ooh. Oculus Quest. And oh, it nice. comes with rechargeable batteries that go in the hand grips with has special covers for the grips. So you just drop your grips in, they charge, and a little magnetic attachment that goes over the USB-C thing. You just drop the thing. You don't plug anything in. You just drop this thing in and everything uh, connects and charges. Whoa, cool. Uh, so also, be, because because we've got this mesh network thing, uh, I love setting up my play area outside in the lawn. So it's like I'm literally outside. Uh, I didn't realize until I took the the goggles off that it was dark. It was dark out. It was it was it was nighttime, <laughs> and I'm just a weirdo with a hat <laughs> talking to people, swinging his arms around. Just the neighbors are hearing like the muffled gold dust, and they're wondering why. <laughs> yeah, why he's out there <laughs> pretty in the much. Of night. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I got a pick. Uh, I, I can share. Uh, I, I mentioned the some of the database software that I was using uh, for for this marbles project, and I was turned on to this by a few friends uh, in, in another community when I mentioned I wanted to do some stat tracking and stuff. And so they recommended uh, Airtable to me. So that's that's what uh, uh, some of that backend stuff is based on. Um, part of it is like. Um, uh, 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 what is it? Project management and, you know, keep track of your sales or keep track of your, you know, status of things. And um, I think it's very strong for that, but also uh, for being able to build a, uh, a what is it called? A, a relational database. I think it's it's very powerful as well. And it's relatively, it's relatively cheap. Uh, I think the plan I'm going to end up using is like $15 a month. Um, and even the free or the ten dollar a month gets you gets you a bunch of stuff too. But I need some of the apps that they have. Um, but they it's it's very similar to Notion, except it doesn't have a lot of the uh, you know word uh, document word processing stuff that Notion does, um, at least built in uh, native. Um, but uh, I I think it's really cool as someone who knows just a little bit about how uh, code works and and how spreadsheets and tables work. Uh, I, I was able to figure out a lot of stuff on my own and implement a, and implement stuff from the community without any trouble. So uh, big ups to Airtable. Cool. Um, my pick, wow, we already talked. Oh, Class Action Park. It's a documentary on HBO about Action Park. I enjoyed it. Felt like three documentaries that they weren't really able to blend together. But... Uh, it really so it does at some, some point just become just a series of people saying, oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and then <laughs> another thing like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I saw that well, once. That's, <laughs> we were talking about it in between the shows, but like there's a documentary about the guy who starts it because he's this crazy character and you could spend more time in 80s Wall Street and 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 figure out like how this guy's pathway and fall from becoming this like a a bizarre uh, lord of the flies walt disney right uh and then there's the cultural element and and you could get into 
New Jersey versus New York. And, and there's a lot of that. And that's where you get all the like, Oh, you, you swang off the, 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 the swing and everybody was calling you names and girls tops were coming off and it becomes more like that. And then there's the like, Oh yeah, people died here. <laughs> and like you can make this is very tragic tale of what happens when things get too far out of control and all the versions of this could all include elements of the other ones, but this one didn't feel cohesive to me. I enjoyed it mostly because one time when I was visiting my aunt and uncle in Long Island, I saw a television commercial for action park and that's, and my aunt said, absolutely not. Uh, and that was uh, pretty much it. So th that was, I, I enjoyed watching it beyond that nice so i watched a documentary it's interesting it was about a guy who was uh an insurance salesman in montana and he had some unconventional ways of selling insurance he ended up becoming a top salesman but he might like go into like a mental hospital and sell a bunch of policies to patients and stuff which is a little controversial he went to the head of the company. He's like, hey, I'd like to be like a vice president or whatever. And they're like, no. So he moves to Washington and he decides to open up a business selling like Japanese imports. And the problem is that time there was a lot of resistance against this because he was doing like motorcycles and stuff. Resistance towards this and the business closes and he's trying to figure out what to do now. And he gets an idea, rent a venue, get a... Uh, some rattlesnakes and some mountain lions and jump a motorcycle over them. He clears the jump, hits the box of rattlesnakes. They fly into the audience, but people overall tend to love it. And so uh, this gentleman, um, let me look up his name, uh, Robert Craig Knievel, um, <laughs> then decides maybe there's something to people watching him do stunts and proceeds to do these stunt shows and realizes they get progressively bigger, but he needs to get more attention. And all within a very short span of time, he realizes, hey, Caesar's Palace has these fountains. And so uh, he goes by the name they called him back. Before he was an insurance salesman, by the way, he like, kind of did B&Es all over Montana and was a bit of a crook. And so the cops used to call him evil. Um, but he changed it to E-V-E-L, e became evil, can evil. And so anyhow, he goes to, wants to do, gets goes to do the, the jump over Caesar's palace and something, the, the fountains there. And something I didn't know was he hired, you know, the, uh, uh, was it John Derrick, who's the, the actor, director, or whatever, to go shoot it. And John Derrick hires his wife shoot part of it. Linda Evans, the actress, she no actually kidding. shot the landing. She's apparently the one wow. that shot that when wow. the evil can evil wiped out going over the fountain. <laughs> so as Linda Evans was on the camera, there is a documentary out. I think it's like Peacock on on Evil Can Evil and OMG. Like, uh, you know, I had. I mean, I knew about the later stuff because he's a bit of a hothead and a bit of a violent kind of guy and, and really a complex guy really good really really being evil that's what it's called it is just a fascinating view into this guy because like he's he's running all these cons when he lives in montana and like you know asking for protection money to make sure your business doesn't get broken into if you don't pay him off you would get broken windows and stuff everybody knew he was doing this he's getting arrested and then he decides he's going to go straight and becomes an insurance salesman <laughs> and then he's like a record selling insurance salesman but also the whole point of like he does go to a mental hospital and sign up a bunch of mental patients to buy policies. <laughs> so it's just, uh, I can't, you got a, a guy who made himself and became an icon in the most amazing sort of way. Really, really fascinating. So oh, nice. evil. that's my pick. Uh, that's amazing. There's so many, so many great moments in there too of like, you know, his friendship, like Elvis and whatnot. And you know, how, you know, they talk about like they have the sports casters club in Hollywood or whatever like this. They hear something you know, they, all the you know they're hanging out and all of a sudden they hear this racing sound and there's some maniac on a motorcycle doing wheelies back and forth. You know, and evil can evil. Welcome to L.A. And so, nice. so that's my pick. A really really good up there with the Bee Gees one in its own way. Nice. It's been weird. After. It's been after. 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 It's been after. <laughs> it's been after weird. <laughs> All right. Good stuff, everybody. We're going to hop offline so these guys can take uh, 
You get ready for a happy hour? Uh, I, I actually think we might need to push it because I got to yeah. figure out what's happening with my board. Okay. Um, yeah, and also not, I don't think I could do all my show minutes. prep in 12 minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, cool. Well, happy hour. We'll be back uh, another time. Thank you, everybody. We've got Cord Killers coming up a little bit later tonight. Thanks for hanging out. Yeah. We'll see you then. Bye. Bye. See ya.